Two, one. Welcome to the Mississauga Life and Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Jaffrey, and I'm joined by, joined by Alex Stackick. Alex, how are you doing today? I'm very good. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, Sean, how about you? I'm doing great, man. How are you uh, enjoying this amazing fall weather we're having? <laughs> <laughs> we're all, we always talk about the weather because it's such a Canadian thing to do. Yes, of course, Canadian topic. Yeah, I am, I am doing good. And uh, of course, if you care to do your job and serve clients, of course, we have to do that. Uh, but most time I am working uh, from home or I'm going to office, but everything is more or less good. Okay, great. So um, we have a few uh, things that we want to go over today. You know, there's uh, new numbers that are being released all the time, new data is coming into the market all the time. And yeah. we just kind of want to make sure that, you know, when it comes to our listeners, our viewers, that we're kind of keep you posted with the latest information. Uh, so we're going to do a couple of things today, Alex. We'll talk about the market, just a quick overview of what the Toronto, Vancouver, Calgary markets are doing. Um, how are they different? We'll talk a bit, a bit about interest rates, how they've affected home ownership how they've affected like sort of the consumer behavior when it comes to spending money in the market. Um, a little side note I wanted to bring into the conversation was this person that I follow on Twitter, uh, Ron Butler, and I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail about, uh, the, about the things that he says when it comes to the mortgage market and you know why it's an important person to follow if you're on Twitter. And then yeah. let's, uh, let's wrap it up with the rental market because the rental market um, shouldn't say surprising, but we've been used to a certain kind of rental market for such a long time. This is a little bit different now. So yeah. let's uh, quickly jump in with the market overview. So mm -hmm. December numbers uh, came out and it showed that uh, listings were down 21% uh, year over year, which is the lowest Q4 we've had in 15 years. Okay. Yes. Um, there is a certain expectation in this market right now that because we're seeing so much less inventory in December right now, we're probably going to see a lot more when it comes to the spring summer markets, because there's been a lot of people that have listed their homes in the uh, fall market, maybe even like towards the end of summer, didn't really get the prices that they wanted because the rates have gone up. So they're going to try to sell their properties in the spring market when they believe that most buyers will be out. And that could be a bit of an issue. And we'll, we'll get into that later down the road. No. Um, as far as the average house prices, um, you know, didn't really move much. We're looking at prices were down about 0.8% month um, of uh, December compared to last year. Uh, sorry, compared to the last month, but compared to the last year, we were down average price 8.9% year over year. Um, it is right. And not only so, that, not mm -hmm. only that, but uh, a very important factor we had to take a look uh, what's going on with the days on the market, December 2021, December 2022. Right. So average days on the market in December 21, when we had hot market was 19 days. Mm -hmm. And these numbers I'm talking about GTA, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. And in December 22, average days on the market was, believe it or not, 40. So it's increased 110% 2021 December to December 2022. 40 days on market. Average. So don't, so this is message for sellers. Don't be frustrated with your agents thinking they are not doing their job. Simply saying this is new market reality that average days on the market is around 40 days. Is it more or less depends on location, price, and all other factors, right? Yes. Uh, there is like you can you can tell like even though the the price itself was down about 0.8 percent, there is a sense that some of the steam has also come out of the market from what the December numbers are. and the days on market number that you that you shared are very important because I believe the month before it wasn't 40 it was it was much less I think it was less than 30 it's yeah. 28 or 27 days <laughs> like that. so that's quite a bit of difference but also, also keep in mind. You know, when you're going into December, January, these tend to be the slowest months when it comes to real estate. So that could be a factor in there as well. Um, and, you know, throw in one or two days of bad weather and it really affects the averages. No of course. Um, okay. So one thing I wanted to discuss was like, I mean, uh, you know, we are seeing, I mean, we've always had power of sale 
uh, listings come in the market every now and then. Like, you know, I did a quick, uh, and you know what, Alex, we can probably do an entire segment on power sales and foreclosures. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, there's, you know, I was just looking at the past records. We had like, for example, Peel, we had like eight to 10 power sale uh, homes last year that sold uh, similar the year before. So what, what, a power sale is and when that happens and you know it's a common part it's a normal part of the market there's always going to be a few of those yeah that's nothing uh to get alarmed about the thing that i noticed though was i saw one that kind of came across my way Mm -hmm. it was a north york detached home which was purchased in 2016 it was purchased for 1.13 million Mm -hmm. and this home ended up selling for power sale recently just in december oh sorry in november and it sold for a million thirty. So even though this person bought it and held it for eight years, it sold for less than what they purchased it for. So now this is an anomaly. I don't think you know this is a common thing, but at the same time, we, no. we haven't seen something like this for a very long time. No, uh, I agree. Second example that I saw was similar home purchased in Stouffville. It was purchased in 2017 for 1.45 million, and it recently sold again power sale for one point. Two five mil. So, bought seven years ago, selling for under asking. What these homes, um, you know, the, what their what their conditions like? Not sure. You know what actually the situation is, but the point is that um, I think we haven't seen uh, numbers like this before. Keep in mind, this is not a normal trend. But you know, as it progresses, if it goes up, if it goes down. We'll keep you posted. But we are seeing this in the market now. So that's, I mean, in in a, in a snapshot, that's what we're looking at when we're talking about. Uh, Toronto real estate for the last uh, absolutely for the last three days. <clears throat> I'm I am monitoring part of the sale market for Mississauga every day, okay. and uh, in most cases, you know, even that market is pretty slow as well. Meaning that uh, you know we have nine, eight, or ten part of sales on daily basis, and most of them they are not sold last ten, twenty, thirty, even eighty days. So it doesn't mean that, you know, by default, oh, this is power sale, this is a good deal, I will buy. So people are more more careful than before make, making decisions, will they jump and buy something or not? It doesn't mean that the power of sale is really ultimately the best possible de- deal that you can get at this moment. And, uh, you know, with uh, this, and I recently, last three, four days, I'm seeing the social medias and a lot of mortgage brokers are um, posting critical announcement days for the change of the mortgage rates, like 25th of January this year. And I think you'll hear six, seven, or even eight additional announcements during the year. So that also build up some, you know, hysteria or, or um, discomfort in the people's mind. Oh my God, should I buy? Should I wait? And this is very common questions, you know, day over day, should I buy? Should they wait? Uh, how to renew, and many other stuff. I also would like to tackle because we, we were discussing about all these numbers in GTA. We discussed about the residential market. I also have condo condo market, and condo market uh, in GTA is again pretty similar to the residential market. So uh, total number of sales third quarter of uh, 2022 because this is the last data we have. And third quarter of 2021 shows that, for example, prices uh, prices increased slightly, only 4.5% for the condo market, the selling price from 689 to 720. Days and markets increase from 19 days to 25 days for the condo markets. It means even it's easier to sell condos because 25 days of the market comparing 40 days for the residential property freehold is 15 days shorter time per average. But again, that um, days of the market is extended comparing uh, Q321 to Q322 for 31%. And uh, sales to new listing ratio dropped for 46% to 41% or overall 23% average drop with the number of uh, apartments on sale dropped for 46%. So uh, that is very similar to residential market because we know that we had 
a number of sales dropped in residential market of GTA for nine, 49, almost 50%. So these numbers are very similar, uh, only days of the market is a little shorter for the condominium properties comparing freehold properties, right? Mm -hmm. So this is from my side in regards to analyzing the GTA market. Predictions, you know, if we are looking for uh, for some predictions, it's very difficult to predict. We don't know what will be in January, in March. But uh, historically speaking, if you remember, and we tackled that, uh, we had that conclusion before, the most closings are happening in GTA in July. So it means by default, usually most of deals, buying and selling during the year will be in March, April, or May, or some short closings in June with 30, 45 days. When you have mostly these closings in July as the most active day in the year, it doesn't mean that that situation will be copy paste this year, but depends what will be situation with the economy, what we with the employment, and what will be with the recession forecasts and all other economical parameters. What about the uh, Alberta housing market? Yeah, uh, in regard to Alberta housing market, let's only give a short overview that Vancouver numbers are very, very similar to Toronto numbers. Mm -hmm. And uh, in regards to Calgary, Calgary is doing, you know, pretty, pretty good because... Relatively you know, speaking. It's, it's, yeah, relatively speaking, mm -hmm. if you compare Vancouver and Toronto, uh, Alberta housing is continuing to outperform. And uh, they have uh, solid economical, economic data. They had 25% uh, new jobs uh, of 104,000 only added in December, which is not bad at all. Calgary home sales fell for 1.9% month to month, seasonally adjusted, or 31% year to year in December. But it is 31% comparing 45 and 49 45 to 50 percent uh, Toronto yeah. and 50 yeah. percent still much is much much better and it's a bull pre-pandemic uh, levels overall and uh, how pri house prices are believe it or not 7.8 percent year over year up comparing 2023 yes. only Edmonton is 1% Lower to the than year before. 2021, right? Yeah. So this is really interesting that, you know, we had investors last year who were thinking about uh, huge opportunity buying in Calgary. Some of them, you know, they took that uh, under strong consideration and either bought resale properties or they moved there and uh, or pre-construction because prices are significantly lower than here in Toronto for same kind of properties. And uh, their mindset is totally different than here. We are looking here in Toronto and Vancouver for investments, investments, investments. And in Calgary, uh, people are looking to have long-term lease. So they are not crazy to buy and to own. They're happy to rent even for the lifetime, same unit. And it's yeah, confirmed not only year... from tenants, but also from builders, because builders are approaching yeah. and saying same story. So five-year rental terms in Calgary are very common, uh, as opposed to the one-year terms here in the greater Toronto area. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, but that's interesting that house prices in Calgary <laughs> are up 7.8% compared to the last year, whereas in the GTA, we're looking at almost 10% compared to the last year reduction yes. in average price. Um, so let's talk about the interest rates uh, for a little bit. So we know that interest rates did go up in December, end of December. We're expecting another rate hike end of January, January 25th or the 26th. I'm not 100%, 25th. but 25th. Yeah. Everything that I'm hearing, everything that I'm reading, uh, we're looking at at least 0.25 basis points increase. Again, 0.25%, the rates are going to go up. Yeah. Um, and that too, you know, they're not ruling out that there's not going to be any more. There may be, again, more interest rate hikes because core inflation actually went up a little bit in December instead of going down. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that's still up in the air. I came across um, 
a study or, or a survey that was done by Manual Life, which is, you know, a financial firm, and they mm-hmm. surveyed their customers. And there's some really interesting findings. I mean, uh, this is the current state or the mindset that people are in. Uh, about mm-hmm. a quarter of mortgage holders say that if the rates rise much further, mm-hmm. they will be forced to sell their home when their mortgage renews. Okay. Uh, about two thirds of homeowners are worried about making their mortgage payments and 67%. Mm-hmm. And how much they owe on their mortgage, about 71%. 81% of all Canadians still say that there is a housing affordability crisis despite falling house prices. Uh, used to be a time where you needed much less uh, proportion of your gross income to be able to afford your housing. Now that's gone up drastically. So yeah. this number is not surprising that even percent still think the housing today is unaffordable. Uh, one out of five homeowners believe they can no longer afford the house that they own. That is, uh, that is, if not alarming, you should at least take note. All right. I know that this survey is only for, it's limited to, you know, people who kind of work with manual life, but it's still, uh, it's something to be noticed. 64% shared, uh, they wanted to own a home, but couldn't afford to. And 85% of those renewing their mortgage in the next 12 months are concerned about what the renewal will mean to their finances. And the reason why it's important that we talk about this is because, you know, a good chunk of the buying that happens every year in real estate, at least 10% is investors. Yes. And the it, 2021, it was more, it was like 25% of all the homes bought were bought by investors. Yes. Now, these are the same people that are saying, hey, if the mortgage rates are so high, if the rate goes up one more time, I can't afford uh, my home. Then do you think they'll be afford able to afford the investment property that they purchased when that comes up for closing in a year or two? So these are all things that, you know, like I thought it was interesting in this study. This is the latest, you know, kind of like the mindset of the Canadians that are our mortgage holders right now. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'm not surprised with these numbers at all. Uh, They're very realistic. Um, And this, uh, you know, for example, 85% of people are afraid of renewing their mortgage in next 12 months is really, you know, Pretty, pretty, pretty serious indicator where we are standing in regards to overall finances and debt. Uh, that will raise a lot of different questions in the future, right? But problem is the problem. I- inflation is growing compared in December, meaning that our our spending is uh, higher than supply. So this is def- definitely somebody has money. All the old people have money. Who are the people I, who have this money? I don't have an idea, right? I, so that I drives your, just, your inflation, by the way. I don't. I don't think that a lot of Canadians have come to grips with the fact that we're we have very high inflation, or we might possibly be going into recession. Uh, we just passed by, you know, Saturday night. Just to share a quick story with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, the wife and kids are like, let's go have some dessert. So we stopped by this dessert place, mm-hmm. and you know, they specialize in waffles and all these other sort of things. Mm-hmm. So I kid you not, inflation, right? Like, I mean, a, a dessert, a waffle, a one single waffle with some ice cream on it is like 20 bucks, right? I mean, that's it's crazy, right? But Unbelievable. the place was packed. There's a lineup outside for people waiting to get in just so they can pay 20 to $25 per person for some dessert. So I don't think, <laughs> from what I saw, I don't think Canadians have come to grips with the reality that we may be in for a tough time. I know people who were saying, you know, situation is, I'm aware of my position and I 100% know that I'm not able to save money for down payment and uh, it's better for me to be on the low rent level because people are renting for 10, 15, believe me, 20 years and they're still on very low level of the rent and they will adjust their lifestyle being aware there is no way they will be able to save or they have significantly to change their lifestyle to save some money to buy something and they don't want to you know to change their life style for 15 20 25 years having some small property life is only one and I would like to enjoy that life. Mm. I would like to have good clothes. I would like to have one or two vacations a year. And right. I really don't care for the bricks and mortars that I have to have. So yeah, you have yeah, yeah. these clients as well. And probably they are not concerned about the mortgage rates.
Yeah, what yeah, is the percentage of people who are not on homeowners and who right. do not want to book homeowners? I don't have an idea, but that mm-hmm, uh, population mm-hmm. we definitely have. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of uh, once I was at a showing and uh, this property was tenanted. And mm-hmm. uh, as you can imagine, like the property wasn't really, you know, very well taken care of. You know, tenants don't will not maintain the property the way the owners will. And uh, we just kind of walked in in dirty space, uh, not very nicely kept. Um, mm-hmm. Open the closet to check the closet uh, to see how much space there is. And the closet was filled with designer clothes, uh, $1,000 dress. I mean, the lady who was with me knew all these brands and everything. She's like, oh, that's a $1,000 dress. That's that's a $500 jack, whatever she knew. And I was just shocked. I was like, <laughs> I was like, you know, being a renter, you shouldn't really be putting all your money in the clothes. Anyways, um, so uh, that's the in, lifestyle, in, right? in terms of consumer spending, what do we have? Okay, so yeah. we're, we've heard from economists, but this is how the Canadians are currently feeling about the economy. So 87% yeah. of Canadians believe they will soon enter or are already in a recession. What I can tell you is that the other 13% mm-hmm. that don't believe are the ones who are at those cafes and those dessert places <laughs> just, just living up the life, right? 48% yeah. Canadians feel overwhelmed by their financial situation. 27% of Canadians say their mental health has worsened over the past year. Half, uh, over half shared that their spending is now outpacing their income. This is when you start dipping into credit. This is when mm. you start dipping into savings, right? 22% say their ability to afford essentials has worsened over the pa- over the past year. So one in five. And you know what, uh, uh, Alex, on, on that note, I remember telling you about the food bank that we usually give to. Mm-hmm. Uh, even over there, they were saying that... Uh, you know, it's coming down to, it used to be like 20%. Now it's like 40% of the people yes. are accessing food banks at some given point because it's coming down to, should I pay my hydro bill or should I buy groceries? So this month, let me pay my hydro bill and I'll go to the, to, to the food bank and get some food. Um, almost all of the Canadians surveyed admit that they're worried about interest rates and inflation. And 54% think it will take at least two years for inflation to return to normal levels. Now, the reason why I bring this up and you know the reason why we're kind of giving this out information out to the viewers and the listeners is that if 54 percent of canadians believe that it'll take two years for inflation to return to normal levels what that means is that people you know logically if that's what they're thinking they're going to start really spending their money very wisely and not spend it on on things that are luxury or things that are not needed so all in all i think we're going to see less money circulating in the economy because everybody's kind of like worried about the future. So contracting economy, not enough money being spent means yes. that businesses aren't going to make that much money. Uh, employment might go down because if the business isn't making money, they're not going to hire people, so on and so forth. Um, Absolutely. So- and, you know, the two numbers uh, which are concerning me are these ones. 48% of Canadians feel overwhelmed by their financial situation. Correct. I think that overwhelmed, it's too polite. People are, you know, very afraid of what's going on with their financial situation. And if you put that in perspective, 54 of them percent are thinking in the next two years, inflation will not count to the normal levels. Probably these numbers with the new mortgage height will be even worse. And uh, it's, overwhelming you know and concerns it's, it's just will the... go to 70 plus percent. It's just the anticipation, right? Like, so if you have a mortgage and you've got it locked in and now your renewal is coming up and you've been paying 2% or 2.4%, whatever it is, and you've been lucky so far, your renewal is coming up this year and there's going to be another rate hike at the end of January. So just the anticipation, the worry of knowing what are we going to do once we have this big jump in our mortgage payment, what are we cutting out? Are the kids going to be coming out from sports from this point on, are they not going to be doing any extracurricular activity? So a lot of a lot of anticipation and anxiety. Um, and you see, this is also trembling my mind. Twenty-seven percent of Canadians say their mental health health has worsened over the past year. So even yeah. even uh, COVID was not affecting them so much, like financial situation in the last one year. 
Yeah, I think during the time of COVID, we had other concerns. We were more concerned about people, you know, life and death and yeah. all that stuff. Um, you know, people were lonely. Um, but now we're looking at this is worse because it's like you feel like a mountain is just going to come down on you and you don't know what to do. Absolutely. Uh, I- Although, you know, it might not be the reality. Worst case scenario, uh, you might be a bit poorer than you were like a year ago. But it just like I said, the mental aspect of it, the anxiety, you know, not knowing what's going to happen, how much worse is it going to get? Those things are very overall, overwhelming. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you're, you're right to point out that that is a concerning fact and a concerning figure there. Um, Absolutely. There's one person I wanted to kind of like bring to your attention if you don't uh, follow. Are you on Twitter, by the way? Yeah, I am. I am. You are okay. You gotta follow this guy, Ron Butler. He's he he's like this outrageous like um, mortgage broker. Really nice guy. Says all the nice things, mm-hmm. and he kind of recently shed a, a spotlight on you know like those secondary lenders, right? Like not the prime lenders. We're not talking mm-hmm. about the major banks. We're talking mm-hmm. about private institutions that like that that lend money at a higher interest rate. So he talks about how <clears throat> excuse me, alternative lender. But uh, this is bad. $1.65 million mortgage last year's rate, last year's rate at 3.24%. This February's initial renewal offer, 8.49% for one year fixed. Okay. Um, as Unbelievable. I posted, as I have posted previously, uh, one of the most affected groups by rising renewal rates are the alternative lenders, right? So this is something... I feel like we've talked about this before, but like this is what percentage of the market do you think, or the market share do these guys have? The alternative lenders, maybe five percent. Yeah, five percent. Five percent. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, so the point is that these guys, if you've got a loan with these guys, these guys can come in and say, you know. What happened, uh, Alex? Was uh, as you know that a lot of people last year. When the interest rates started going up, you know, they got their pre-approvals done. They said, okay, you're approved for a million dollars. Okay, good to go. They go ahead and purchase a property. Mm-hmm. They go to the bank. They go like, here's my paperwork. The bank says, hey, you know what? The rates have gone up. We can't give you a million dollars anymore, right? We can give you 900000 Yeah. Right? Uh, we've done the appraisal, blah, blah, blah. Things have changed, 900000 Even though we give you a pre-approval at this point, it, is, it doesn't mean much. Now, this yeah. person has to close because they're given a deposit of $50,000, $100,000. What do they do? Alternative lending. Yeah. To make, to make the shortfall, alternative lending. And these 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 guys really take advantage of the situation. If you're looking at 8 to 10% interest rate, they can ask after the year, like they can ask for this money back anytime. Yes. What are you going to do? Right. So this is a, so follow Ron Butler, number one. And number two, um, it's kind of hard to assess how much of an effect this is going to have on the market, but it will have an effect on the market because these guys too, keep in mind, a lot of these guys, Alex, they have their money from their home equity line of credits. Yes. Is it not true? Of course. Right now, I don't know what is your equity line of credit interest rate, but mine is, I think, 6.49. So. They are definitely giving money for 10 percent plus, right? Exactly. And yeah. when we are discuss when we are discussing about these numbers and the mortgage payments, monthly mortgage payments, we are talking about eight, nine, ten percent. Most of that money you are paying interest. You are not contributing to your mm. principal at all. Mm. So you are you are dumping your money, ten thousand, eleven thousand, who knows how much, mostly to pay the interest interest payment, yeah right yeah it is really devastating for most people and of course then we have these mental issues and concerns what's going on right correct another um, question will be for people okay mm-hmm. we'll probably come to the one given point uh i had to face fact that i'm going to lose my my house i have right now one client who made very unreasonable actions last year, uh, believing that situation, the market will improve. And I warned her minimum six, seven times that she has to be prepared for the upcoming storm in coming months because of economical trends. And she was very stubborn. Now her payments for primary residence came from uh, 4,000 to 7,200. And she called me a few days ago and she told me all my accounts are empty. Single Mm -hmm. mother with three kids 
and buying investment property that brings negative cash flow. Can you help me? Mm. So it's very, very, and renewal mortgage with uh, alternative banking will come up with 11% and instead of paying 7,100 a month, it will be probably 11,000. Who can pay that? That's right? crazy. And this is individual case. I know how many uh, types of, uh, what similar cases we have. Yeah, I mean, even uh, anecdotally, it doesn't. Right? It's not. It doesn't look good. No. Um, so w- w- I'll get into that whole negative cash flow thing in a bit. Like we, I wanted to bring uh, now to the uh, our viewers to the rental market and see mm-hmm. what that's doing right now. So uh, I don't know if this is going to be surprising or not, but it looks like the rental market is cooling down a little bit. Um, it's uh, showing us that uh, we had a record number of condos uh, that came into the market. We're expecting a lot of closings this year, actually, uh, mm-hmm. coming into the market. These are all, you know, condos that were booked like three, four years ago, and they're going to be closing this year. So it'd be interesting to see what happened because, you know, the rates have gone up. Are people going to, are these investors going to basically sell them? Or are they going to rent them out? I think they're going to do both. They're probably going to put it up for sale. There has, There is a cutoff point, obviously. And then if it doesn't, while it's, and this happens too, by the way, while it's up for sale, it's also up for rent. So in the event it doesn't sell, they end up renting it. All right. They can do both simultaneously. It's legal to do both at the same time. My concern is, you know, because if you, if you see the numbers... Of course, in 2020, we had 22,000 uh, condos which were completed and closed. For this year, it should be 32,000 condos to hit the market. But the question is, how many of these 32,000 condos will really be closed? With these mortgage rates. Yes, yes. Again, uh, private lending and all that stuff. Or, uh, for, for sorry, for example, I mean, I'm not even trying to get into private lending, but this has got some. This doesn't have to do with private lending, but more to do with the ability to close. Yes. Uh, what ultimately end up, ends up happening is because they're not able to close with conventional lending or with mm-hmm. the conventional banks, they end up going to private lending, and now even private lending is kind of pulling back and saying, "Hey, we just you know, our, the rates are too high." You know, so even and if we charge you, what we charge you. Yeah, that, that that brings you to hundred percent negative cash flow. It's only question <laughs> uh, what the extent of negative cash flow you will have and how much, for how how long you can yeah. hold and keep that negative cash flow, right? So this is interesting. Uh, you know, I don't know if you ever looked at it in this perspective, but the the amount of cash flow, the negative cash flow, has significantly grown in the last yes. few years. Yes. Um, in Average monthly rent in the region was twenty seven thirty three. We're talking about condos, uh, and the owner had to pay seven hundred seventy three dollars out of pocket every month. Okay, uh, so their mortgage was thirty five hundred bucks. The rent is twenty seven hundred bucks, and they're putting out seven hundred seventy dollars out of pocket every month. And that was up from an average shortfall of two hundred thirty five dollars a month in third quarter twenty twenty one. So. We're talking like a year before in 2021, you were in negative cash flow of $235. Yes. Right. A year later, you're in negative cash flow of $773. But in 2019, the average negative cash flow was $17. So we went from 17 to 773 in merely three years. Is that not crazy? It's absolutely crazy. And definitely we, <clears throat> we are noticing, uh, decreasing of the rents in the last two consecutive months. And this is actually mm. very normal in uh, winter times. People are not so willing and keen because of holidays, uh, because, uh, you know, minus temperatures to move from location to location, from property to property. So we are, we are recording uh, last two months, definitely weakening of the rental market. Uh, will that continue uh, in next months? We really don't know. But also Airbnb supply also, which was stopped in GTA, open a little bit market for the uh, rental market, of course, especially con rental market in Toronto downtown. But in my opinion, on the long run, on the long run, the rents will go up. It's a question of time. Because if you remember, we discussed so many times, we have in the next three years overall 
more than 1.5 million people as um, new immigrants. And even if every year we have 32,000 condos hitting market, it's only less than 100,000 condos. Yeah. Where do these um, people live? Another interesting dynamic to take into consideration that has changed is that we don't have 25% of the buyers being investors anymore. Right? Absolutely. So there's going to be a bit more inventory available than usual. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, like, again, we always say there's so many moving parts to this thing. It's hard to make pred uh, predictions with, you know, any sort of accuracy. So we can just kind of, kind of uh, get a pulse on what the people are feeling at this point. Look at the numbers of the previous month or the previous year or whatever it is and kind of predict the trend. But when it happens, it happens and we'll report on it. Um, I think there may be a chance the condo market might be cooling down. Uh, if there is a record level of new property, new homes hitting the market this year, that may be the case. But again, like I said, these aren't things we can predict. Let's see Absolutely. what happens. All right. I have one question for you, Sean. Yeah. Um, let's say that you have a client buyer who would like to buy in coming months. Mm hmm what will be your suggestion for for such clients? Should they buy? What what are they? they wait? Are they buying to to move into uh, it or to, as a as to an live, investment? To live, to live, to live. What to, what would to be live. your general what would be your general suggestion? So my general suggestion would be, um, what's the money doing right now? The money that you have for that down payment, what are you doing with it? Where is it? If that money is just sitting there in your bank account. And you feel like it is getting devalued, mm -hmm. and you know your dollar last year is now worth like seventy cents. Let's just say, for example, yeah, uh, are you comfortable with that? Right? Are you okay with that? Or if you put it into uh, real estate, and if you bought something and you have the capacity to hold on with the current rates mm -hmm. uh, and live in that property for the next five years, you'll be okay. You'll do okay. You'll save some money. You'll build some equity. You'll pay off some principal over the five-year period term. Yeah. Uh, and you will not be renting because when you're renting, all that money is going into thin air. It's just it's evaporating. So Absolutely. It's, a, it's a decision you have to make personally. I would say it just depends on how much money you have and what are you doing with it. If yes. you have the ability to hold on for a little bit, um, you just want to see what happens, that's fine. You can do that. The only thing that we can go by is what has happened in the last couple of months. And from what I can tell, last couple of months, the average price hasn't really moved much up or down. So I don't know. Set a timeline for yourself. If things really haven't changed the way you want them to change, uh, you know, make a move or not. But it's a personal decision. I personally think it just depends on what your current situation is. Absolutely. And very good point. Sitting money on account, doing nothing is the worst possible scenario. Or investing yes. in some low yield uh, investments as well. Sure. If you took your money and you invested into something while you're waiting for the real estate market to adjust or whatever it is that you think it's going to do, that's fine. But if it's just sitting yeah. in your bank account, it's not doing anything because money in itself is nothing. So, you Absolutely. know, do some calculations, punch some numbers, see what works best for you. I agree with you. And uh, final note about the um, tenants and landlords. I believe that situation requires special attention from landlord's side, if they have really good tenant, try to be humble, polite, and keep them because you know, you never know when you have again such kind of tenants or not, right? First of all, you know, it's humanity. You need to be a nice person anyways. There's no there's no advantage and there's no benefit in being a jackass. That's like first of, of course, all, right? Absolutely. Uh, secondly, like the situation as it is, you know, the instinct that an investor or landlord has is that, hey, look, the market rates have gone up. Um, I need to charge more, mm -hmm. right? Uh, my tenant's in there and he's paying like last year's rent. I need to get that. Mm -hmm. And now if the rates were to go down, no landlord's going to say, hey, you know what? The rates have gone down. Market rent's gone down. My tenant needs to pay less. <laughs> it just mm -hmm. doesn't happen. But what does happen is if the market shifts and the rents do go down, the tenant has all the freedom to get up and go somewhere else and pay mm -hmm. less money. Um, however, f speaking purely from a human perspective, if you are a good landlord, you take care of your clients or your tenants rather, and you are a good human first and foremost, 
then I think most people don't really care about the difference between a couple hundred dollars here and there. And yes. they would stick with somebody who is reliable and honest and takes care of them. So, I mean, that's just my two cents. That's what I would do. But uh, I agree. Know, again, everybody kind of has to make that decision for their sums, for themselves. I agree. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You're right. All right. Thank you, Sean, for your time today. I think we talked about very important topics uh, that everybody I should think, be aware yes, of. Yes, yes. We right? actually kind of went way over time. Uh, we're, we're almost <laughs> at 40 minutes, but hopefully solid information. Uh, if you guys have any questions, any concerns, please feel free to reach out. Uh, leave in the comments in the comment section. We're always here to help answer any of your questions and keep you posted with the latest information. Um, I think we should uh, definitely, you know, we don't have enough, enough time now, but we should definitely leave some time in the next segment for talking about power sales, what they're all about, whether you should be focused on them or not, et cetera, et cetera. What do you think? I agree. Why not? Why not? All right. I agree with Perfect. you. Perfect. Let's Great get to next week. Thank you. Okay. See Alex, you always nice talking to you. Thank we'll talk to you See soon. you next Take week. Take care. Thank you. Bye, Bye now.